us today on the topic, Nobody's Perfect. Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 5. There it is on the screen for those of you that do not have a Bible. Luke 13, 1 through 5, in the King James text today reads, There were present at that season some that told him, meaning Jesus, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Nobody's perfect. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Father, we love you, God, and we thank you. We thank you for this time of year during which the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is celebrated around the world. We thank you, God, for the wonderful impact that this event has on the lives of people, believers and non-believers alike. We thank you for the atmosphere, God, that is created in our world as we celebrate the incarnation and the coming of our God. Master, in the name of Jesus, as the Word of God would go forth today, we ask, God, that your anointing, your power, your presence would rest upon the preacher, and you would help me, O oh God, to deliver this Word in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Help me, Lord, today. I want so much to be a blessing and an encouragement to the people of God. I don't want anyone in this place, I don't want anyone watching by reason of the internet to walk away from this message empty. I want them, Lord, to be encouraged and inspired and uplifted. I want their faith to aspire to higher heights and deeper depths than they've ever before known. And in order for this to be accomplished, my God, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch not only the mouth of the speaker, but touch as well, O oh God, the hearing and the heart of every hearer. We ask it right now, God, in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You might notice today by the visual aid that I'm employing in my PowerPoint presentation, that I've got a picture up there with the title, Nobody's Perfect, of a beautiful actress by the name of Halle Berry. I will tell you, I, you may differ in opinion, you may have different thoughts on the subject, but I think Halle Berry's about one of the most beautiful women on the planet. I really do. I think she is just one of the most gorgeous things. There are many beautiful women in the world. Uh, but Halle Berry to me is just about nearly the image of perfection. You know, she is just gorgeous. She, you know, uh, whenever you see her, she can just stand in front of me and I'll just sit there and look at her for a while. She's like a painting, you know. She's like a work of art. And I read an article some while back that dealt with a <clears throat> some sort of a beauty index. Some scientists or some doctor, somebody had done some research on human uh, beauty and attributes. And, and he had created this formula. And it, according to this formula, basically it was kind of like, you know, we call people a number 10 if they're really beautiful and, you know, a zero if they're like me. Well, uh, he had created this formula, you know, 
And in the course of the article, it actually said that Halle Berry rated at the highest levels of this formula that her facial features and her whatever, all, all her different attributes came together and they kind of give her the high end of the spectrum score. And this formula he had put together had to do with how the attributes of your face were balanced and like, uh, you know, how, you, how everything, I forget exactly how the formula worked, but anyway. So Halle Berry rated way up there. And of course, I'm sure I'd, I'd rate way low on there because I got a nose like a two-car garage. And that kind of throws my facial features out of sync. But I love me some Halle Berry. And if there's a woman on the planet that I think is close to being perfect, it's probably Halle Berry. But the truth of the matter today is my sermon title suggests nobody is perfect. The passage that I've read to you today is a passage that I've heard spoken and preached many, many times in the course of my life and yet, honestly, I really think a lot of times people completely miss the truth that is found in this passage. I think they completely miss what the Lord Jesus Christ was trying to say. We love to try to find fault and place blame. When bad things happen, I talked about this recently when I preached on Job. When bad things happen, we love to try to figure out, you know, what you do wrong that brought that upon yourself. And Jesus is speaking today in Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 5. And he speaks of two situations where people were murdered and people died because of calamity and disaster. And he said, do you suppose that these people died because of who they were or what they did or because their sin was greater than other people's sin? Because, folks, that's how we love to look at stuff. Of course, we've got people like Pat Robertson, you know, who loves to tell us that there are wildfires in California because Ellen DeGeneres was allowed to host the Oscars. I mean, how stupid. And these are supposedly some of our greatest Christian leaders. To hear people tell it, you know, these, these television preachers, why, my God, they're... They're next to God like no other. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Pat Robertson. You know, that's the order it works in. And yet the reality is, Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And I myself have preached from this very passage, and I've used this passage to emphasize the necessity of repentance. However, if you look at this entire passage and you really contemplate it and think about it, you'll come to realize that Jesus is making a simple statement using these calamities as his illustrations. And what he is simply saying is, nobody's perfect. You think these people died because of some great sin in their life? You think these people were murdered because of some great sin in your life? Well, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What is he saying? He's saying, you're no better than they were. Don't get it in your head that they had some great sin in their life because the truth of the matter is the same thing that happened to them could happen to you. Because why? Because nobody's perfect. You're no worse than they are. You're no better than they are. They're no worse than you are. You know, this notion that somehow they deserved or they earned the calamity that came on their life, the Lord said, no, because that same type of calamity, that same kind of disaster could happen to you. And the bottom line is we all must repent. We all must turn 
from the things in our life that don't please God, the things in our life that are not compatible with Christian living, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. The Lord says nobody is perfect. Many Christians and many preachers today get things all backwards. They love to assign, listen, they love to assign blame for bad things on God. Now listen to what I'm about to say so you really catch this. And they give credit for good things to the devil. Say, Pastor, they give God credit for bad things happening, and they give the devil credit for good things happening. What are you, what are you talking about? Um, I just gave an example a few moments ago, Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, there are wildfires in California. There's an earthquake in California because Ellen DeGeneres, a lesbian, an open lesbian, is allowed to host the Oscars. So therefore, God sent earthquakes. God sent wildfires. Am I telling the truth? They don't blame the devil for those earthquakes. They're not giving the devil credit for them earthquakes. And then if you turn around and you back them into a corner and you say, well, I'll tell you what, if God is so unhappy with Ellen DeGeneres being an open lesbian, then my question is, how come she is so successful and so rich? How come she's had one of the longest running, most popular television programs during the daytime of anybody? How come that then? Oh boy, now you got them. Now you got them. Because if God's responsible for the earthquakes and if God's responsible for the fires, then who's responsible for her success and her wealth and her prosperity? Oh, but now, now, here's the answer you get. Well, that's the devil. Oh, Satan will be happy to reward you when you walk and live in sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Satan wants people to believe that they can live as sinners and they can live ungodly and they can do all the wrong things and still have it all. That's the devil. That's why she's got such wealth and such success and such prosperity. Oh, I see. So let's see. God is responsible for the negative things and Satan's responsible for the positive things. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, that's what I preach. That's what Pat Robertson preaches. That's what Franklin Graham preaches. That's what Kenneth Copeland preaches. But Tommy, they get it all backwards. The Word of God says in James chapter 1 and verse 17, listen carefully, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning oh my so according to James the good stuff don't come from the devil mm -hmm. it comes from God mm -hmm. well now in the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans and he is actually in essence rebuking them and he says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Oh my, you mean to tell me God doesn't beat people into repentance? You mean to tell me God doesn't strike people down so that they'll find their way to the altar of repentance? That is exactly the message these preachers preach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like God's trying to tell you something so you'll repent. Um, Paul said it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. That's My right. goodness and mercy. Oh, I'm going to tell you, see, God isn't stupid. He knows if you're going to win somebody's heart, you're going to win them a whole lot quicker with flowers and candies 
than you are if you beat them and you abuse them. Right. But see, a lot of people don't seem to understand this. And there are a lot of people in the LGBT community, a lot of people in the church world today, straight, gay, and otherwise, who don't understand how things really work. God is not the author of the bad things in your life. God is not the one to be blamed when terrible things come along. He's in control. Those things could not happen if the Lord didn't allow them. But there, if they happen, then somewhere in God's plan is your benefit. Somewhere in God's plan, things are going to work out to benefit you. As Joseph said to his brothers when they came to him seeking help during time of famine, he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Hallelujah. So even when bad things happen, God has a plan for good. The Apostle Paul said, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. But Booby, He uses good things. God woos us to the cross. He doesn't beat us to the cross. God tries to lure us to the cross of Calvary. He tries to lure us to a place of repentance by extending blessing and extending His love and His grace our way. And the sad part is, so many people get this all backwards. Yeah. And the enemy loves when the preacher gets up and preaches it backwards. He loves when the enemy gets up and tells people that the reason all these terrible, horrible things are happening is because God is trying to beat you into a state of repentance. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how many people I know will come to me and boy, they'll just be full of all kinds of bitterness and negativity and they'll say, well, you know, I heard this preacher on TV say this. I heard this preacher on TV say that. What kind of God would act like that? What kind of God would be like that? And then I have to explain to them, well, let me tell you a little secret. That preacher on TV is all wrong. That preacher on TV is not telling the truth. Don't get mad at God because they're misrepresenting Him. Am I telling the truth right. today? Yeah. Oh, they get it all backwards. The Word of God said, listen, in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, meaning the devil, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Oh, I'm telling you, that old message that bad things happen because God is whatever is all wrong. Preaching that God is the author of the negative and Satan is the author of the good is completely opposite to everything the Word of God says. Let me tell you something, folks. I've cast out many a demon in my day. And when I cast demons out of people, there ain't one of them demons ever has tried to help that person be rich. There's never been one of those demons that tried to help that person live a good life. There's never been one of those demons that's ever tried to help that person have peace or joy or love in their life. That's not how demons work. That's not how the enemy works. Every demon I've ever cast out has always been driving that person to destruction, been driving that person to depression, been driving that person to failure, been driving that person to suicide. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I'm come that they might have life. And they might have it more abundantly. Don't get this thing twisted. Don't get this thing backwards. Don't say God sends these horrible, negative, terrible things in order to drive men to repentance. No, that is how an abusive parent treats their child. They beat the kid into acting right. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not talking about my God. My God is not an abusive parent. Got news for you. When you come into relationship with Jesus Christ and you become part of the bride of Christ, um, my God is not 
an abusive spouse either. That's right. He doesn't beat his wife into submission. He doesn't beat her into doing the things he ought to, that she ought to do. No, that's not how God operates. He said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You know, I'm going to go back to the 50s for a minute. I'm going to talk about life the way it used to be. The wife would stay at home oftentimes and take care of the home while the man went out to work and made money and, you know, supported the family. But that man who loved his wife, he went out and he'd buy toasters and he'd buy vacuum cleaners and he'd buy all these devices that would help at some level to make his wife's work a little easier. Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. He'd do everything in his power. He'd bring things home to his wife say, Honey, look, I, I got you this. And, oh, uh, 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 an automatic clothes washer. My God, I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother used to have one of them old washers, you know, and it had the ringer, you know. And you'd have to put the clothes through the ringer and squeeze out all the water. And then she'd have to go to the clothes line. And some of y'all are so young, you're saying, Preacher, what in the name of God are you talking about? But trust me, you know, this was real. This really, this is how we used to do it. And even my mother, when I was a kid, there were times we had uh, clothes lines, you know. And they'd have to go out and they'd have to clip them clothes up on them clothes lines so the air could dry them, you know. And then Tommy, they'd wait a day or wait half a day, and then they'd have to go out and gather all those clothes up, take them off the clothesline, bring them in the house, and start folding them, you know. And, of course, back in the day, you didn't have all these no-wrinkle fabrics either. Poor mom. Boy, I mean to tell you, she'd have to whip out the ironing board, and she'd have to iron out all them shirts and all those pants. Oh, my Lord, ironing used to take up a lot of mom's time. But any spouse that loved his wife wanted to make her life easier. Am I telling the truth? Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. No, if some preacher has convinced you that God is an abusive spouse, they're lying to you. Our God is anything but an abusive spouse. Hallelujah. Our God is there to make your life the best life you can have. He does everything He can so that every year you can go on vacation. He does everything He can so that every payday you can get flowers. He does everything He can so that everything you have to do in this life you can do with ease and convenience and comfort. Am I telling the truth? See, a lot of people don't understand this prosperity doctrine that has been preached in the church now for many years is so foul and so ungodly and so wrong, it's not even funny. It's not about prosperity is a biblical word. It's a word we read in the Word of God. But prosperity is not about abundance. It's not about having more than other people have. It's not about having better than other people have. Prosperity doesn't have anything to do with uh, how it compares. Prosperity is about God will prosper you, meaning He will allow you and help you to live your life with the greatest ease possible. You'll have peace. You'll have joy. You'll have things in your life that other people wish to God they had. Hello now. And it, you may not be as rich as some. You may not have the big cars and the fancy houses. But honey, you're going to have things in your life because God has prospered you. You are going to have things in your life they only wish they had. Things that only God alone can give. Nobody's perfect, Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. I remember growing up as a kid, my father was very much a perfectionist. There were words, four words my father never used. I don't think I ever heard him say good enough. <laughs> Sometimes, Tommy, I'm doing something and you'll hear me say, oh well, good enough, right? Mm -hmm. 
Say, oh, well, it's not perfect. I, I know I made a mistake. I know I didn't cut this just right, or I didn't glue that just right, or I didn't paint that just right. But you know what? It's good enough. Because I'm not a perfectionist. I won't allow myself. I used to be like that. Lucky for Tommy, he met me long after I was able to push that trait back. When you grow up in that environment, I'm going to tell you, you tend to grow up that way. I remember as a kid, my father would be cutting moldings to put around the door, or to put a, along the floor, you know, in a room. Maybe he just put some paneling up, or maybe he just did some painting or something. And he'd go to cut the molding to put it up, and he wouldn't quite cut the, the miter. He wouldn't quite cut the angle right. Now, if you put it in there, there'd be a little tiny bit of a gap. Not much at all, just a little bit. And you could easily fill that gap with a little bit of uh, stuff, you know. Can't think of the word I want. And it would look fine, but you know, it wasn't good enough for my father. No, he'd have to run back to the lumberyard. He'd buy a whole new piece of molding. He'd come back and he'd recut that new piece of molding until it fit perfect and it looked exactly right. Because everything with him had to be perfect. Everything had to be exactly the way it was supposed to be. Huh. Only problem is if a if an expert came into the house, say a master electrician or a master plumber or a master carpenter they could look around the house and they could look at the same work my father did and you know what Tommy they could find things he did wrong they could find things that he didn't do right you know why because from their perspective they're looking at it very different you see they're experts they know exactly what right is. My father thought he knew what right was. He thought he knew what's perfect. What do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church today who love to look at other people and pick them apart based on what they think right to be, what they think perfect to be. God's up in heaven looking and saying, you know what, honey? Uh, you're no more better than they are because when I look at you, I see all kinds of things that aren't right. I see all kinds of things that aren't done the way they ought to be done. You think they are because from your perspective, from where you sit, it appears to be. The only problem is you're not me. Mm -hmm. You're not the expert. You're not the one who knows professionally exactly how things ought to be done in order to be done right. We can only do the best according to our knowledge and our own level of competence. You know, there's one downside to perfectionism, and that downside is criticalness. People who tend to be perfectionists also tend to be critical. I've got a brother who reminds me so much of my father sometimes that I just want to scream. Uh, I'm not very impressed with my father, to be honest with you, having grown up with the man. He was very abusive and nasty and what have you. And uh, not a well-liked person by anybody, never mind his children and his family. He wasn't liked by hardly anybody. And uh, having a little trouble, my left arm has gone numb. So pardon me while I'm trying to figure my, it's tingling. My whole left arm from my shoulder all the way down to my fingers is tingling. But anyway... But my father, you know, he, he was a perfectionist. Everything had to be done perfect. Well, the problem is, growing up as a kid, uh, everything we did was never good enough. 
Everything we did, he found fault with. Everything we did, he picked apart and criticized and ridiculed. All I'm going to tell you, there are people in the church who think they're perfectionists and they think they're perfect. They think the way they do everything, Tommy, is perfect. And they look at everybody else. And they find fault with every single thing everybody else does. Because after all, they've got it all right. They know how everything ought to be done. Well, there are straight people in the church that look at us and affirming churches and say, you can't be Christians, you can't serve God, you can't be what you're supposed to be because of who you are. The only problem is they never once stop long enough to realize, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Nobody's perfect. You're no better than we are. You've got as much sin in your life as I've got in mine. It may be different. It may be in different areas. It may be in different ways. But honey, it's no different in quality or quantity. That's right. But the problem is perfectionism breeds criticism. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, the Word of God said, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. You see, God being the expert, God being holy, God being just, God being perfect, can look at everything in our life that we deem to be perfect and holy and right and recognize that we're so far from the mark it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. But we still want to look at the folks who Pilate killed and mingled their blood with their sacrifice. We still want to look at the folks upon whom the tower at Siloam fell. And we still want to assume that all this bad thing happened because of what was going on in their life and because of who they were and because of how they conducted themselves. But then the Lord comes along and reminds us, no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What was he saying? He's saying, you're no different than they are. The possibility that the same thing happened to them could happen to you is very real. The fact of the business is nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect. I remember my grandfather, my mother's dad. I will tell you, my, my grandfather, bless his heart, for all his warts and all his faults and all his failings in his life, he gave a lot of very wise and very stable advice over the years. One of the things my grandfather told me many years ago that I'll never forget, he said, never work on your own house. He said, if you need something fixed in your house, if you need some work done, whether it be carpentry, whether it be plumbing, whether it be electrical, he said, always hire a professional. Now, Grandpa, he he raised ten kids, and he worked a factory job, and he made good money. But they lived as poor people, because when you got ten kids, you know, it takes an awful lot of money to make everything go around. Grandpa said, now, I'm not saying that I've always done this. He said, because I couldn't afford to do it. He said, but if I could afford to do it, you better believe I would have. He said, I'm going to tell you why. He said, because every time you work on your own house, he said, every mistake you make is going to stare you in the eye every day of your life. He said, you cut that piece of molding wrong. He said, every time you sit in that room, he said, you're going to be looking at that molding and you're going to be thinking, oh, I cut that wrong. That never did come out right said, if you do the electrical, if you do the plumbing, and things go wrong, he said, you're sitting there thinking, I don't have to see, I didn't, I didn't do that right. I messed that up. He said, no, the best thing in the world to do is hire somebody else to do the work. 
Because working on your own self, you just become painfully aware of all your errors and all your mistakes. You know, the good advice in what my grandfather said is this. Pay attention to your own house. Pay attention to your own self. If you pay attention to your own self, I'm going to tell you something. You will never, ever, ever run out of things to find faults with. You will never find that you're short of a list of things that aren't just exactly what they ought to be. And I tell the truth now. If you'll pay attention to yourself instead of looking at other people, you will remember this truth today. Nobody's perfect. And when you remember that nobody's perfect, you don't tend to look at the Galileans and you don't tend to look at the people in Siloam upon whom the tower fell. You don't tend to look at them as critically and with such judgment because you are ever mindful of the truth. Nobody is perfect. You know, most churches today, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take my jacket off a moment. I've got to finish this up. Wait. Something ain't right. Most churches today, as far as I'm concerned, ought to be called Church of the Baboons. You know, they call themselves Church of God, Church of Christ, Word Churches, Faith Churches. They ought to be called Baboon Churches. Why? Because most churches are filled with people who sit around picking bugs or faults off of one another. And they're not just content to pick the bugs and pick the faults out of one another's fur, but when they're Picking them out, Tommy, after they pick that little fault out and after they pick that little bug out of their fellow church members' fur, they eat it. They put it in their mouth. Oh, it becomes sustenance for them. You ever known somebody love to sit around and criticize and judge everybody? And boy, I mean to tell you, it's almost like if they couldn't do that, they would drop dead. It's almost like they got their living. They got their sustenance from criticizing and picking other people apart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, we got too many today who are sitting in First Church of the Baboon. They need to be sitting in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God says in Luke chapter 6, verses 40 through 42, the disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. What is Jesus saying? What is he reminding us of? He's telling us today, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Say, Pastor, why are you even bothering to tell me this? Why are you even bothering to preach this today? Because, folks, one of the most important truths we'll ever understand in this life is what I'm telling you right now. If you want to live the Christian life and you want to be victorious and you want to do things the way they ought to be done, then this is probably the most important lesson you'll ever learn today. Nobody's perfect. And by that I mean don't put too much pressure on yourself because nobody's perfect. And don't put too much pressure on your neighbor 
because nobody is perfect. You know, one of the things that breaks my heart, and I'm trying to close right now, I, I saw somebody online just today who had posted a comment about how apparently church folks had really hurt her and disappointed her, and they had done something that really disturbed her, and she put a post on Facebook about it. And I thought to myself, you know, the sad thing is, people tend to expect a lot more out of their church family than they do out of the world, don't we? Mm -hmm. Don't we tend to expect more out of our fellow brothers and sisters than we expect out of uh, people in the world? Of course we do, because we believe that we're all trying to live by a higher standard. We're all trying to follow God's path. And we're all trying to follow God's leading. And we're all trying to do things the way the Lord has articulated and the way the Lord has uh, laid it out for us. And we get upset and we get disappointed and we grow weary when people in the church don't do us the way that we believe they ought to and they don't act the way they ought to act. But you know, part of the problem is in us because we forget nobody's perfect. There are a lot of people today who are out of church, especially people in the LGBT community. And they're out of church and they're away from God because somebody in the church hurt them and somebody in the church disappointed them. And somewhere along the line, when I say nobody's perfect, they just take that as a platitude. They just say, oh, those are just words people say. No, it's not just words people say. It is a fact. Part of what probably caused those people to hurt you is that they are not aware of this. Am I telling the truth? Part of the reason that you're as upset with them as you are is because you are not aware of this fact. Nobody's perfect. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Do you understand why this is such an important lesson to learn? Do you understand why this is a truth that benefits us all to understand? Nobody's perfect. Don't sit around in judgment criticizing others don't you dare, straight person, sit around criticizing an LGBT person who's trying to live for God and trying to be a Christian. Don't you dare sit in judgment of them. Nobody's perfect, honey, and that means you too. While you're sitting around judging by your standard and your understanding of how things ought to be done, God is looking at you by His standard and His understanding of how things ought to be done. He's looking at you as the master craftsman. And He's recognizing all the cracks. He's recognizing all the chips. He's recognizing all the faults. The only difference is God is too full of love and too full of grace to sit there and abuse you because of your faults and because of your sins. No, instead, the Word of God, He uses His goodness to lead us to repentance. Instead, according to the Word of God, He does everything He can to help us have a life that is more abundant. He does everything He can to pour out upon us Good gifts, because all good gifts and all perfect gifts come from above. They come down from the Father of lights. Folks, the most important lesson you'll ever learn today as a child of God is this. Nobody's perfect. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. <laughs>